It is so good to see all of you. Uh, I've got a couple of... I've got, I've, got, I've got some uh, special, special folks uh, who are with, with us here today, so I just want to make sure that I announce them all. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, thank Chancellor Tim Ryan and all the staff here at the University of New Orleans for their outstanding work. I want to thank uh, the governor of the great state of Louisiana, Bobby Jindal, who is here. No, no, I like Bobby's doing a good job. <laughs> hey, hey, hold on a second. Bobby, if it makes hold on. Bobby, first of all, if it makes you feel any better, I get that all the time. The and the second point is that you know, even though we have our differences uh, politically, one thing I will say is, is that this person's working hard on behalf of the state, and you got to give people credit for working hard. He's a hard-working man. Uh, we've got uh, our senior senator from the great state of Louisiana, Mary Landrieu. We've got uh, our lieutenant governor. I don't know if he's related. His name's Mitch Landrieu. We've got an uh, outstanding uh, member of Congress, uh, Charlie Melanchon. And we've got our, our newest uh, member of the Louisiana delegation, Joe Cow, from this district with his beautiful daughter. Joe, what's your daughter's name? Huh? Betsy? Betsy? She is adorable. <laughs> hey, Sophia, how you doing? Yeah, those are some cute kids. They look like mom. That must, that's mom right there. There you go. Well, she's, she's gorgeous, like your daughters. I'm big on daughters. Uh, we've got the, the mayor of New Orleans, Ray Nagins, in the house. There's a feisty crowd here. <laughs> House Speaker Pro Tem Karen Carter Peterson is here. <laughs> Senate President Joel Chasson is here. And we've got just uh, some wonderful members of my cabinet who have been down here nonstop trying to make sure the federal government is a good partner on the recovery process. Secretary Janet Napolitano of the Department of Human, uh, Homeland Security. Secretary Sean Donovan of HUD. Secretary Arnie Duncan of Education. Arnie was supposed to be sitting right here. I don't know where he is. He was right behind me. Chairwoman of the White House Council on Environmental Quality, which is very important in terms of restoring wetlands, Nancy Sutley is right here. And finally, just uh, I want to say thank you to uh, Reverend Phoebe uh, Rope for the invocation, Maggie Clombs for leading uh, the pledge, and Shamar Keith Allen on the horn playing the national anthem. All right. Good to be back in the Crescent City. It's, it's all, I love you back. <laughs> it's always an inspiration to spend time with men and women who have reminded the rest of America what it means to persevere in the face of tragedy, to rebuild in the face of ruin. Now, Katrina may have swept through the city, but it did not destroy this community, and that is because of you, the people of New Orleans. It has now been just over four years since that terrible storm struck your shores. And the days after it did, this nation and all the world bore witness to the fact that the damage from Katrina was not caused just by a disaster of nature, but also by 
a breakdown of government. That the government wasn't adequately prepared, and we didn't adequately respond. Now, I saw the consequences of this failure during my visit here as a senator and then as a candidate for president. So when I took office as president, one of the first things I did was tell my cabinet and senior staff that our Gulf Coast rebuilding efforts and our disaster response efforts were going to be top priorities for this White House. I wanted to get it right, and I wanted us to be ready. And so far, I'm pleased to report that we've made good progress. We've got a long way to go, but we've made progress. Over the last nine months, we have sent more Cabinet members to this region than almost anywhere in the country, not just to make appearances, but to listen and to learn and help you move forward. As we've continued this recovery effort, I've made it clear that we're not going to tolerate the usual turf wars between agencies. So we've prioritized coordination between all levels of government. We put in place innovative review and dispute resolution programs to get projects moving forward quickly. We freed up over $1.5 billion in recovery and rebuilding assistance that had been tangled up in red tape for years. And this assistance is allowing us to move forward together with projects that were stalled across the Gulf Coast, projects rebuilding and improving schools, investing in public health and safety, repairing broken roads and bridges and buildings. And this effort has been dramatically amplified by the Recovery Act, which has put thousands of Gulf Coast residents back to work. On the housing front, we're tackling the corruption and inefficiency that plagued the New Orleans Housing Authority for years. We've also been able to dramatically cut the number of people who are still in emergency housing. We're moving forward, uh, we're moving families towards self-sufficiency by helping homeowners rebuild and helping renters find affordable options. On the education front, I just visited Martin Luther King Charter School, the first school to reopen in the Ninth Ward and an inspiration for this city. We've also worked to be a better partner and free up funding that has allowed places like this university, right here, the University of New Orleans, and, and the Southern University of New Orleans to rebuild. We're looking for ways to be more flexible so New Orleans can build the school system it deserves. And because a lot of your public schools open themselves up to new ideas and innovative reforms, we're actually seeing an improvement in overall achievement that is making the city a model for reform nationwide. That is good news, thanks to the hard work being done right here in New Orleans. When it comes to health care, we've invested in supporting health centers and in recruiting more primary care providers and nurses and other medical professionals to fill the shortage left by Katrina. We remain committed to building a new VA medical center in downtown New Orleans so we can better serve and care for our veterans. And to help fight crime, we're helping to hire cops and rebuild jails. So that's what we're doing in terms of rebuilding and recovery. But we're also focusing on preparedness and response so that history does not repeat itself. We are committed to making sure that a disaster like Katrina does not happen again. And that means in Washington, a focus on competence and accountability. And I'm proud that my FEMA director, Craig Fugate, has 25 years of experience in disaster management in Florida, a state that's known its share of hurricanes. And I think Republicans and Democrats will testify to his skill and experience. We have, we have put together a group led by Sean Donovan and Janet Napolitano to study disaster recovery across the country to figure out how to do it better. Across the country, we're improving coordination among different agencies. We're modernizing our emergency communications. We're helping families plan for crisis. And here on the Gulf Coast, we're working to make sure this region is protected in the event of a 100-year storm. We've already seen 220 miles worth of levees and flood walls repaired, and we are working to strengthen the wetlands and barrier islands that are the first line 
of Defense for the Gulf Coast. This isn't just critical to this region's physical protection, it's critical to our environment, it's critical to our economy. That's why we're establishing an interagency working group that will be responsible for coordinating our restoration efforts across the Gulf at all levels of government. Now, even with all the action we've taken, all the progress we've made, we know how much work is left to be done. Whether you're driving through New Orleans, Biloxi, or the southern part of Louisiana, it's clear how far we have to go before we can call this recovery a real success. There are sewers and roads still to repair. There are houses and hospitals still vacant. There are schools and neighborhoods still waiting to thrive once more. So I promise you this, whether it's me coming down here or my cabinet or other members of my administration, we will not forget about New Orleans. We are going to keep on working. We are not going to forget about the Gulf Coast. Together, we will rebuild this region, and we will rebuild it stronger than before. It is going to be stronger than before. I know that for a lot of you, the questions and concerns you have aren't limited to the Recovery Act uh, and the efforts that are taking place here on the Gulf. You're also wondering about the recovery effort that's taking place throughout America, because an economic storm hit about nine months ago, ten months ago, caused this recession uh, that is as bad as anything we've seen since the Great Depression. And it, obviously, it hasn't left behind the death and destruction that Katrina and Rita left behind, but it's caused incredible pain and hardship for communities all across this country, communities that have seen too many jobs disappear, too many businesses close, too many middle-class families who are just barely making it. And these families are the backbone of America. They're the ones who built this country and made it great. You. And keep keep this country going each and every day. And so you deserve leaders in Washington who are willing to work as hard as you work, who are willing to fight for your futures. And that's why our goal is not just to rebound from this recession. It's to build an America that works for everybody, where everyone who's looking for work can find a job, not just a temporary job, but a permanent job that lasts from year to year, season to season. We want an economy where our stock market's not only rising again, but our businesses are hiring again. And people's incomes are going up again. We're not going to rest till we get there. Now, the Recovery Act we passed earlier this year has helped stop the bleeding. Everybody agrees on that. It's put tax cuts in the pockets of working families and small businesses. It extended unemployment insurance and health insurance to people who'd been laid off. It saved or created hundreds of thousands of jobs in the private sector and made sure the teachers weren't being laid off and police officers weren't being laid off in states that were hemorrhaging because of lost tax revenue. But the Recovery Act's just the start. If we want a recovery that lasts, if we want an economy that really grows again, we've got to rebuild stronger than before, just like you're doing here in New Orleans. We need to come together and meet the challenges that were with us before this recession hit. Schools that weren't closing before the recession. That means building a clean energy economy that can lead to millions of new jobs and new industries. That means building an education system that equips every citizen with the skills and training they need to compete with any worker in the world. That means building a health care system that finally offers security to those who have insurance and affordable options to those who don't. And let me say, we're going to get it done. We're going to get it done. Too many Americans, too many Americans have waited too long for this to happen. We are going to pass health care reform by the end of this year with the help of Mary Landrieu, with the help of Charlie Melanchon. Maybe with the help of Joe Cha, we're going to get health care done this year. Now, just in case any of you were wondering, I never thought any of this was going to be easy. 
You know, Elizabeth, sometimes these reporters on the news are, well, why haven't you solved world hunger yet? Why, why, why is it everybody done it? It's been nine months, why, why, you know, why isn't there? I never said it was gonna be easy. What did I say during the campaign? I said, change is hard. And big change is harder. And after the last nine months, hey, you know I, I wasn't kidding. <laughs> I wasn't kidding about it being hard, but you notice I wasn't kidding. I don't quit. We get this stuff done. We keep on going until we get it done. I don't quit. You know, let me tell you. Those folks who are trying to stand in the way of progress, they're, they're all, let me tell you, I'm just getting started. I don't quit. I'm not tired, I'm just getting started. fired up. No, but I, I, I think it is important for, for, for those folks to understand, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just ready to go. I am, well, we're just going to keep on going. And, and, and the reason is, is because there are too many folks out there who are having a tough time to get tired. The easiest thing in the world would be to just say, okay, well, I don't want any controversy. Let me take the path of least resistance. But that means that the same folks who were struggling before we got elected are going to keep on struggling. People, if they had high premiums on their health care before, they're going to have even higher premiums after. That's not why, that's not why I applied for the job. The challenges we face, both here on the Gulf Coast and throughout America, they're big, they're complex challenges. They don't lend themselves to easy answers or quick fixes. Meeting them requires diligence and perseverance and patience. It also requires more than just government programs and policies. It, it, it requires a renewed spirit of cooperation and com commitment among our citizens. A, a renewed sense of responsibility to ourselves and to one another, which is why it's important, whether you're dealing with a Republican or a Democrat, that we are maintaining civility, that we are listening to each other, that we are willing to find areas of common ground and cooperation. It's the same spirit that took hold of this city and this region in the days after Katrina, the spirit that sustained you to this day. You didn't get tired. As hard as it was, you're still out there, still working hard, still rebuilding, still committed to your city. I've talked a lot of, uh, today about what steps we've taken at the federal level to help the Gulf Coast recover and rebuild, but the true story of this com is, is this community's unbending, uh, unbending resilience. That doesn't start in Washington. It starts right here in the reborn neighborhoods of the New Orleans begins with the men and women who waded into deep water, climbed onto rooftops, and risked their own lives to save people they'd never met before. Begins with the doctors and nurses who stayed behind to care for the sick and the injured, without equipment, without electricity, like our nation's Surgeon General, Dr. Regina Benjamin, mortgaged her house, maxed out on her credit card so she could reopen her clinic and, and help care for victims of the storm. All the volunteer firefighters from this city recently traveled to Iowa to help another community recover from the devastation of a tornado. They went because they still remember when New York City firefighters who'd been through 9-11 came down to New Orleans to help folks out here after Katrina. 
The story of this city's resilience begins with all the men and women who refuse to give up on their homes, who've stayed to clean up and rebuild not just their own homes or their own yards or their own lives, but their neighbors too. Here at the University of New Orleans and at other colleges and universities in this city, this year's graduating class will be the first class that chose to apply to a New Orleans school after Katrina. Think about that. They knew what had happened here. They knew how much work was still left to be done, but they chose to come anyway. They wanted to be here. Of all the signs of progress I've mentioned today, that's the most powerful. The idea that there's still people coming to this city, especially young people, who are committed to its future, who are ready and willing to withstand what storms may come, eager to rebuild something better in place of what was. That's the kind of commitment and determination we need at this moment, not just here in New Orleans, but all across America. And if we can harness that spirit, I have no doubt that we will succeed in meeting our greatest challenges. And I am grateful to all of you, because I know that you are here because you believe in the possibilities of remaking America to become what it can be. Thank you very much, everybody. Appreciate you. Thank you. We're going to take some. Uh, we're going to take some questions now. Now here, here's. Hold on a second. First of all, I'm, I'm going to get a sip of water. Excuse me. Well, it's nice to see you. All right. Uh, everybody can sit back down. We're going to take some questions. Now the uh, here, here's what we're going to do. Uh, is we're going to just. Uh, Whoever has a question, raise their hand. I'm not going to be able to get to every single person. I, uh, I'm going to go girl, boy, girl, boy, so y'all don't, so, so nobody gets mad at me. And uh, if, if there are people with microphones in the audience, so w when I call on you, if you can wait until you get the microphone and introduce yourself so that we know who you are, all right? I'll uh, I'll start with uh, that gentleman in in, in the in the right there, Reverend. Good to see you. You look good today. Thank you, sir. You bet. I'm Reverend Smith from Rayville, Louisiana, and Mr. President, my my question is that we have a 30 percent dropout rate in the United States, and in my community, I, I what we feel like in our community, we we don't we don't knock uh, private schools and we don't knock other schools, but in our community, we took our dropout rate from a 13% to a 0.8. And we have a we have a 97% uh, uh, attendance rate. That's excellent. We, we don't have any gains in our schools. And I was and our G, our uh, graduation rate went up from a 64% this year to a, a 73.5. And that's a concern to me in the United States that we are losing so many young men, not only Afro-American men, but all men. And my question to you is that. I know that my Secretary of State, and I support you and him, we should not look at just different schools, but we should look at all of our children in all of our schools and, and target that, you know, because no one school doesn't, does not have not all problems. We have problems. Well, look, at the, uh, there's a reason why I went to visit uh, Martin Luther King uh, Charter School, uh, because, as I said before, a good news story about New Orleans Let's face it, the schools weren't working for the children in New Orleans before the storm. And, and, and what has happened is, is that uh, commu this community has actually used the crisis as an opportunity to start rebuilding and try to experiment with new ways of learning. One of the things that we did in the Recovery Act that got very little attention at the time, but I think is one of the most important things we did, is we said, you know, we're going to help schools uh, on construction. We're going to put money into uh, the state so that, you know, the governor doesn't have to lay off uh, or, or, you know, the school, local school districts don't have uh, as big of a problem in terms of uh, their budgets. But what we also did was we set up something called Race to the Top. 
And what Race to the Top said is, we're going to set aside $5 billion that states can compete for, but here's the deal. In order to compete for it, you've got to make sure that you're showing us how are you reducing the dropout rate and improving uh, performance in low-performing schools, how are you improving teacher quality and really emphasizing teachers, because that's the most important thing in a school is teachers, and, and, and are we giving them the support and the ins and the training that they need? How are you keeping effective data so that we know what's going on in these schools and people, kids aren't falling through the cracks? So there are a whole series of things that we are initiating to try to be a good partner with states and local school districts to raise our expectations, but also give them the tools. I mean, one of the problems with No Child Left Behind was that it had a bunch of tests and had, I think, legitimately high expectations, but it didn't always follow through with the tools that schools needed in order to actually achieve these goals that had been set. So we want to provide those resources. Now, Reverend, I think you'll, you'll agree with me when I say that I can work hard, states can work hard, city can work hard, all the, every government official can work hard to try to improve our schools, but if our parents don't <laughs> insist on excellence from their children, we're, we won't succeed. So that's why, you know, when I visited the school today, I had beautiful kids. I mean, they were just charming. And, and, and smart, and they're sitting there and introducing themselves and describing all their projects, and they were very proud of their school, you could tell that the adults had invested in making sure that they understood they were important, they were special, but we also had high expectations of them. They were sitting still. They were, yes, sir, yes, ma'am. Uh, just that home training <laughs> makes a big difference. Now, not, not, not every child... Not every child is going to get the support they need at home, let's face it. But all of us, in one way or another, in our communities can be supportive of our children, helpful in making sure that they've got somebody, an adult, that they can look up to. You know, it can be in the church, it can be in a community center, but really giving our young people that kind of support, that's, so, that's at least as critical, I would argue more critical, than what government's going to do. So that's a challenge not just to me. That's a challenge to all of us. Everybody's got to be involved. All right? Okay, it's a young lady's turn. It's a young lady right here. You. Hi, Mr. President. My name is Narkis Barak. Is that and, right? Um, wow. Yes. <laughs> you and me. <laughs> and um, I'm a single mom of three daughters. I have my eldest here. She's hey, 12 years old. What's her name? Uh, Yasmin. Yes, mean? Yeah, That's and a nice she name. goes to Lusher, which is one of the top schools here. Um, my question has to do with an article that came out today in the Times Picayune, um, in which it reported that Tom Pirelli, the associate attorney general, was lauding local um, non governmental and governmental agencies in um, the effort to help women who are victims of domestic violence. Um, I know, I don't know if you know, but the rates of domestic violence rose quite dramatically after Katrina mm -hmm. yeah. and have continued to rise. Um, and one of the problems is we've got agencies that are helping women with things like therapy and food and help with their children. The problem is that our legal aid clinics, Tulane, Loyola, NOLAC, all of these clinics have been so overburdened with cases that have to do with Katrina that a lot of people can't get access to legal help. Now, the segment of the population that's most suffering from this are women, and by extension, children. Mm -hmm. You can sit in court in Jefferson Parish, in Orleans Parish, for a whole day and watch a whole docket of cases, and not a single woman has legal counsel. So I wanted to ask you, I know that, yes. that you and Mr. Biden have been supporters of the Violence Against Women's Act, Women Act, and um, I was wondering what you can do to ensure that women in southeast Louisiana have their civil rights protected and their due process protected? Well, the, uh, it's a great question. I, uh, as I mentioned, uh, you know, speaking broadly, obviously there continue to be concerns about crime in the region post-Katrina. And 
not only have we helped to fund uh, Mayor Nagan and others to be able to uh, rehire cops and rebuild police stations and so forth, but also to, to build a more effective uh, judicial system, because that goes with it. Uh, we've set up a violent crimes task force that uh, is up and running and coordinates between the FBI and all the various local and state agencies. So there are a range of steps that we've taken generally to address crime, but I think you're making a really powerful point, which is that when it comes to domestic violence, oftentimes that's uh, underreported because women don't feel that they have the support they need uh, in order to step out from those situations. The issue of legal representation is still a big problem. So what I'd like to do is to learn more specifically about what's happening here. Uh, I will ask, uh, I'll probably ask Tom Pirelli since you mentioned him, um, uh, who's, who's uh, Deputy uh, Attorney General, to make sure that he uh, investigate specifically how we can work more effectively with the legal aid organizations down here uh, to provide more support. So thank you for bringing that to my attention. That's great. All right, it's a man's turn. It's a, it's a man's turn. I want to make sure. That gentleman right back there. Right, right. No, no, right you. Yeah, yeah, right. Do you? Right there. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Gabriel Bourdain from here in New Orleans. My question is regarding FEMA reimbursements. <laughs> Why is it four years after Katrina we're still fighting with the federal government for money to repair our devastated city? Uh, Delgado Community College, the largest vocational educational institution in the region, recently had to turn away 1,500 students because FEMA is only offering $19 million to repair buildings that suffered $40 million in damage. We have also been without a full-service public hospital for the last four years because FEMA <laughs> very popular. We've been without a full-service hospital for the last four years because FEMA is offering $350 million less than the true damage costs incurred. I mean, I expected as much from the Bush administration, but why are we still being nickel and dime in our recovery? Well, look. Uh, let, let, let me say this. First of all, uh, I will say to every single person in the Gulf region, you could not have a better FEMA director than we have right now, and I think our agency is working around the clock to clear up red tape and to eliminate bureaucracy on backlogs that go back years. Now, as I said, it, it, you know, the... Uh, I know since a lot of these problems have been going on since Katrina happened, people understandably feel impatient. Uh, on the other hand, uh, these things were not all going to be fixed tomorrow. So we are working as hard as we can, as quickly as we can, to process through many of these issues. Now, you mentioned, for example, Charity Hospital. The, the, uh, we are committed to working with the city and the state to make sure that we have world-class health facilities here in New Orleans. But what is also true is that uh, there are all sorts of complications between the state, the city, and the feds in, ter in, in making assessments on the damages. Now, I wish I could just write a check. You know, you say, why not? Well, you know, there's this whole thing about the Constitution and Congress and, you know, I, uh, not to mention the fact that, you know, I'm always, you know, one of the interesting things you find out about being president is uh, everybody will attack you for spending money unless you're spending it on them. You notice that? So, <laughs> so. We've got to go through procedures, but here's, here's the good news. For example, on Charity Hospital, I know the state has agreed to go through an arbitration process that Mary Landrieu helped set up that is designed to cut through and avoid a long, tangled mess so that we can actually start rebuilding and, and providing services. <laughs> Janet Napolitano has done a great job in creating a bunch of alternative 
mechanisms to resolve these disputes. And, and Janet, how many have we, what is it, 76 uh, of these disputes that we've already resolved? At least, right? That's part of the reason why we sprung loose $1.4 billion of money that had been held up for years. Now, that may not be, sound like a lot of money to you, but it's real money. So, so I guess... So I guess my point is this. The, uh, I make no excuses for the fact that the federal government did not uh, work effectively with state and local governments immediately in the aftermath of the storm to make sure that everybody got the help they needed right away. And we are still working through the backlog of problems that existed. But I, you know, I will say that uh, you know, I think not only Democrat Mary Landrieu, uh, but also I think Republican Governor uh, Jindal will tell you that our team is outstanding. They are working really hard all the time to try to get these things resolved as quickly as possible. And my expectation is, is that by the, by the time that uh, my term is over, you guys are going to look back and you're going to say, this was a responsive administration on health care, on housing, on education, that actually made sure that the money flowed and that things got done the way they were supposed to get done. All right. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a lady's turn. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, uh, to... Uh, 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 all right, the sister friend right here called out, so we'll get a mix here. No, right, right here. Right, that, that's them right here. Latina. Yes. Yeah. Buenas tardes. Buenas tardes. Uh, my question is, um, there's a lot of cases that have been um, mothers losing their children because of immigration. Mm -hmm. And the, mo the kids are lost in the system. I don't think that's fair. I know, if, you know immigration is illegal, but we have to keep the families together. What is going to happen? Well, the, the, uh, first of all, uh, you're right that uh, this is heartbreaking. The way to solve it is to solve our immigration problem more broadly. Um, in the short term, Janet Napolitano is also in charge of immigration. She's got a lot of stuff on her plate, by the way. Give Janet Napolitano a big round of applause. She's working hard. You know, in the short term, what we're trying to do is to apply our immigration laws in a humane way that recognizes you don't want to just snatch a child from a mother. If the child's a U.S. citizen, even if the mother may not be, it's a very complicated problem, but the way sometimes this has been administered, I don't think any, any of us would feel good about in terms of reflecting American values. Right? You've got a, a small child that suddenly gets sent into some foster care system and the mother is sent away. So we've got to, we've got to deal with that short-term issue. The long-term problem, though, is the fact that we are a nation of laws and we are a nation of immigrants. So we believe in immigration. The vast majority of folks here, y'all came from someplace else. And you know, I, I don't have a lot of sympathy to folks who suddenly, uh, once they're in, don't want anybody else to come in. That doesn't make sense to me. But, but we're also a nation of laws. And that means that when there are people in Mexico City waiting in line and paying their fees and doing everything right, and they are having to wait for years, and then other folks are coming in without waiting in line, that's not fair. And it's not, it's not fair to them. And it's also putting an enormous burden on, you know, for example, our borders. And it's often unsafe. A lot of people die at those borders trying to cross them. So what we're trying to do is to create a mechanism for comprehensive immigration reform that would have some basic principles. Number one, we would strengthen the borders. That has to be done. Number two, we would be serious about going after employers who are purposely hiring undocumented workers because they don't want to pay a minimum wage or they don't want to pay them overtime or what have you. 
You know, everybody talk, you know, you have these raids where they go in and they grab uh, 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 some undocumented workers. Yes, they broke the law, but, you know, they're just trying to feed their families. Go after these big companies that are purposely hiring those folks because they're the ones who are actually taking advantage of the system. <clears throat> so that's the second thing. The third thing, then, is we've got to figure out, we've got several million it's estimated, let's say, somewhere between 10 and 15 million undocumented workers who live here. And they've been here for a long time, and many of them have children here who are going to schools and are now U.S. citizens. And what I've said is the notion that somehow you are going to send all those folks back, you're going to line up a whole bunch of buses. That, and by the way, they're not all from Mexico. They're from Ireland, they're from Poland, they're from Ghana, they're <clears throat> because that's another stereotype, I think, that, that often gets promulgated. So now they have broken the law, so what I've said is let's let's acknowledge they've broken the law, they've got to pay a fine, they've got to learn English, they've got to uh, jump through a whole bunch of hoops, pay back taxes, but let's give them a pathway whereby they can get right. They can get legal, and then, and then that way we will not have these kinds of situations where families are potentially being pulled apart. But it's, you've got to combine the two things. You know, sometimes there are those on the left who want immigration reform, but they don't want to acknowledge the fact that, well, we've got to strengthen our borders. And you can't just do one without the other. On the other hand, there are some folks who just say, just crack down on the borders, but they pretend like somehow we're going to send back 12 million people, and we're not. So let's you know, just get serious about this and solve the problem, and I think that we've got an opportunity to solve it uh, in the next year or two. All right? Thank you very much. Okay, it's a guy's turn. It's a man's turn. <laughs> guy's trying to flash his credentials here. <laughs> no. This gentleman right here. You. Yes, sir. Right there. Good afternoon, Mr. President. Good afternoon. And What's your name, sir? Elliot Labatt, New nice. Orleanian, all the way. There you go. Nice to meet you, sir. Welcome to New Orleans. Thank you, sir. My question is regarding health care reform. For years, uh, well, I'm on Social Security, and so is my wife, Peggy. Hey, Peggy. <laughs> she's, very, she's very attractive. Thank you. <laughs> We've just celebrated our 50th anniversary. Hey, give her a round. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, regarding health care reform, uh, we've been on Social Security for a while. And every year, uh, up until now, the, the Social Security Administration has announced uh, inflationary increases. Right. Uh, my question is this, is that what can health care reform do, or what will it do, to help reduce the cost of Part B? Because Part B takes away what increases we've gotten in the past. Well, first of all, uh, let me point out that uh, under the formula, Social Security would not see a COLA this year, an automatic COLA increase because we've actually had deflation, right? Costs have gone down 6%. But because of the hardships that folks on fixed income have still experienced, uh, I've been supportive of the idea that a one-time $250 payment to seniors would be an appropriate ap approach which would approximate, would come out to about 1.8% increase. Okay, so that just deals with the issue of uh, what's going on with Social Security. In terms of Part B and rising costs generally, here's what we believe health reform would do. First of all, it would contain costs generally, and this is not now our assertion, this is the assertion of the Congressional Budget Office, which is nonpartisan, that it would start lowering costs across the board because it would change how we use our medical system. You know, it, our medical system is so inefficient. You know, we get five tests when we only need one. We have paperwork and bureaucracy 
all through the system. You go into a doctor, you have to fill out five forms. But you notice this is the only area of, of uh, the economy that's not uh, digitalized. You know, it's very easy for you, uh, for, the, for the credit card companies to find you and send you your bill, but somehow you can never get a decent bill that makes sense and that you can read in healthcare because all the paperwork involved. So there are ways that we can streamline the system that will reduce costs and that will help control costs not just in the private sector but also for Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid. Now, the other thing that is important is that one of the biggest costs for seniors is prescription drugs. And we are estimating that we can save a minimum of $80 billion, and it may be more, that will help close the donut hole on prescription, uh, prescription drugs for seniors under Medicare. If you combine these various savings that would affect both Part B and Part D, then we actually believe that over the long term, you would not see health care costs going up at 8% when your Social Security check's only going up 2 or 3%. But the only way we achieve that is if we reform the health care system to slow health care inflation. And this is why, you know, for those of you out there who wonder, well, what's in it for me? I've already got health insurance. I, don't, I can see why if I didn't have health insurance that... I'd want health insurance reform, but I've got health insurance through my job and it's working pretty well. Why do I want health, ins health insurance reform? Well, here's why. Health I, I just told you that last year inflation actually went down. I mean, we had deflation. Not so in healthcare. In healthcare, costs went up 5.5%. Your employers are experiencing increases of 15% on their premiums, 20%. Their share that they pay for you, you may not see it in your paycheck, but they're paying it, and it's going up 15%, 20%, 30%. How long do you think it's going to be before employers start saying, I can't afford this, so I'm either going to drop coverage for my workers, or I'm going to start charging a lot higher out-of-pocket costs? That's already happening, isn't it? How many people have seen their costs go up on their health care bills? So... It's your premiums have doubled. The average family's premiums have doubled over the last 10 years. And it is a certainty. This is not speculation. It is a certainty that if we do nothing, your premiums will double again over the next 10 years. It might only take five for them to double. And it is going to eat a larger and larger part of your paycheck. So, so even if you've got health insurance reform, we've got to control costs over the long term. Now, you've heard a lot of funny tales about this health care reform bill, so let me just be clear here. Nobody's talking about cutting benefits under Medicare. Nobody is talking about uh, somehow forcing you under government plans to, 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 to lose the health insurance that you have. All we're talking about is giving you some options some better choices, and more security in the health insurance that you have. So they can't drop you when you get sick. So you can still get health insurance with a pre-existing condition. So you don't have huge high out-of-pocket costs. So your employer, if you work for a small business, can go into an exchange and pool with other small businesses and other individuals to get a better deal from the insurance companies. You know, nothing's harder right now to getting insurance than if you are self-employed or you work for a small business. Be because, because what happens is you don't have enough workers for the insurance company to really want your business. So what we're going to do is we're going to set up an exchange. That means suddenly you've got a million people bargaining instead of one. And that means you're going to get a better deal, and that means insurance companies who want the business of all those individuals and those small businesses are going to want to compete. So, and by the way, I just want to warn you, even though we now have every committee in Congress having voted out a bill and we're closer than we've ever been, this is when the insurance companies are really going to start gearing up. Because now there's, you know, their stock went down when the Senate Finance Committee voted out that bill. 
Now they're getting nervous. And they, and they, by the way, they have been wildly profitable over the last decade. And this is when you're going to start seeing a whole bunch of those ads. And, and I just, if, if it says, you know, uh, some funny named group out there that you can't really identify, you know, Americans for good health care or something, but you've never heard them before, it's probably a front group for the insurance industry, and don't let them fool you. We're going to get this done. We're going to fight for it. All right? Okay, uh, that was a man one. Right there, all right. <laughs> this young lady right there. Right there. I broke your heart. No, oh, come on. Go ahead, right? Yeah, go ahead. Good afternoon, President Obama. Hi, what's your name? <laughs> okay, my question what's is What's your name? This. My name is Davida. Davida? Yes, sir. Hey, Davida. How are you? I'm good. <laughs> okay, um, President Obama, I'm not an environmentalist and I'm not a scientist, but it doesn't take a genius to figure out that something is wrong in the environment if it's October and the weather is as it is. I, rec <laughs> I recently, um, I'm a Louisiana native and I recently moved back home from California where there it was a big push for um, going green and environmental right. policies. Here there isn't even a recycling program that's free in home. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go ahead. <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> My question for you is in the midst of all the other important things, such as health care, education, domestic violence, and all those things that you do have on your plate, and right. I recognize that. How can we make, or how can you, as a leader of the government, make environmental policies um, more effective? Okay, well, the, it's a great question. <laughs> Nancy, if I get into trouble, let me know, because this is one of my top environmentalists. Uh, she knows what she's talking about. Um, well, look, look, let me, uh, let me talk about some very specific things that we can do. Uh, and then let me speak overall about what uh, a, a huge challenge is going to be. Um, we have already invested through the Recovery Act in uh, probably the biggest clean energy investment in American history. I mean, we are providing tax breaks to businesses that are creating wind power and solar power and renewable energy. Uh, we are uh, providing funding for the retrofitting of, of buildings that, so that they become more energy efficient. Uh, we are looking at weatherization programs where we can hire young people who don't have jobs to go in and start insulating buildings that will save people's energy bills over the long term. So there are a lot of specific things that could be done both at the federal level and at the state level. And I'll be honest with you, I'm not familiar enough with what's being done specifically here in Louisiana. So that's why all these folks here have been taking notes. And I am sure that they will want to report back to you. Uh, they're going to want, you should give them your names, and they're going to get your name and your address, and they will send you all the information about what's being done, because I'm sure they're doing some things uh, here locally. Um, no, I, I'm confident. But. But look, he, here, here's, here's both the, the broader challenge and the broader opportunity. Uh, the challenge is that there's almost no dispute among serious scientists that climate change is real. And if the planet keeps on getting warmer and water temperatures keep on rising, there's almost no dispute among scientists that that means worse hurricanes more frequently, uh, more violent, and other 
shifts in weather patterns that are going to create drought and famine and displacement, not just here but around the world. We're, we're, we're pretty sure about that. The second thing we know is that we used to be about 30 percent dependent on foreign oil. We're now about 70 percent dependent on foreign oil, which means that you know, we just send billions of dollars over to somebody else, basically ship out their wealth. Now, Louisiana is an oil state. Gulf Coast is uh, obviously very important to our energy independence, and, and Mary Landrieu and others have been battling to make sure that Louisiana uh, continues to build on its, uh, its you know, energy treasures. But the fact of the matter is, is that if we don't think about using energy more efficiently, then we're not going to solve the climate change problem and we're not going to solve the energy independence problem. Now here's the good news is that coming out of this recession, we're going to need a whole bunch of new areas of industry to employ people. And clean energy offers probably the best opportunity to become a huge engine for economic growth and innovation in our economy. So. What I think we need to do is to increase our domestic energy production. I'm in favor of finding environmentally sound ways to tap our oil and our natural gas. I'm in favor of, uh, there's no reason why technologically we can't employ nuclear energy in a safe and effective way. Japan does it, and um, France does it. And it doesn't have greenhouse gas emissions, so it would be stupid for us not to do that in a much more effective way. But, but the most important thing we can do is to also develop new sources of clean energy and drastically ramp up uh, our, uh, our energy efficiency. And so I'm going to be pushing legislation after health care. I can't do it all at once. We've already got some progress out of the House. We're going to have some more progress to be made in the Senate. There are going to be disagreements, and I'll be honest with you, you know, folks in Louisiana, a lot of whom are employed by the energy industry, sometimes are going to be suspicious about, well, how does this affect oil and how does this affect gas? And that's legitimate. Uh, that's part of the give and take process of, uh, of our democracy. But I ultimately am convinced that we should be able to put together a package that puts people back to work, makes us more energy independent, and saves our planet in the process. And I'm looking for partners uh, from government, but this is also an area where government alone can't do it. You've got to be involved. There you go, this guy right here, he says he's ready to go. You know, for, for, for you to think about how are you using energy at home? How are you using energy in your businesses? Are you buying long-lasting lights? Are you uh, installing insulation that saves on your energy bills. All those things cumulatively make a huge difference. There was an article today in the New York Times about the fact that one of the biggest uh, emitters of greenhouse gases is all the natural gas leaks at factories. And it turns out that if producers would actually seal up those leaks, not only would it be great for the environment, but they'd also make money because that's money going out of their pockets from all those leaks. So there's just a bunch of common sense stuff that we could do that would make a huge difference, uh, but frankly, everybody's got to chip in and the transition is going to take some time and you know, people don't like change sometimes. They're, they're comfortable doing the things they're doing. Yeah, I know a whole bunch of you guys, it took a long time before you decided that Hummer didn't make much sense when gas was 350 an hour, you know. <laughs> you know, I, you know, you like that big car until that gas went up to four, and you said, "Man!" <laughs> All right, I've got time for one more question. Um, it's a man's turn, isn't it? It's a guy's turn. Okay, here, here, here's, here's this this young man right here. I'm gonna let him use my special mic. Hey, this is a big guy. Don't go, oh, come on, man. I mean, this is a, all right, what's your name? Sharon 
Terrence Scott. Huh? Terrence Scott. Terrence Scott, what do you have to say? I have to say why people hate you and and why you they supposed to love you and God is loving. That's what I'm talking about. Come on, man. Yeah, hey, come on, hey. That's what I'm talking about. Terrence. I appreciate that. What what grade are you in? Fourth. You're in fourth grade? Well, now, first of all, uh, I did get elected president, so not everybody hates me now. I don't want you to. Oh, I, I got a whole lot of votes. I want to make sure everybody understands. But you know what is true is if you, if you were watching TV lately, it seems like everybody's just getting mad all the time. Um, and I, I, you know, I think that you've got to take it with a grain of salt. Some of it is just what's called politics, where you know once. Uh, one party wins, then the other party kind of gets, it feels like it, it needs to poke you a little bit um, to keep you on your toes. Um, and so you shouldn't take it too seriously. And then sometimes, I, as I said before, people just, uh, I think they're worried about their own lives. You know, a lot of people are losing their jobs right now. A lot of people are losing their health care or they've lost their homes to foreclosure. And they're feeling frustrated. And when you're president of the United States, uh, you know, one of th you got to deal with all of that. That's exactly right. And you know, uh, you you get some of the credit when things go good, and when things are going tough, then you know you're going to get some of the blame, and that's part of the job. But you know, uh, I'm a pretty tough guy. Are you a tough guy? You look like you're pretty tough, and and so you just got to keep on going, even when. Uh, folks are, are criticizing you because as long as you know that you're doing it for other people. All right, so thank you. You're a fine young man. I appreciate you. All right. Give Terrence a big round of applause. All right, everybody. I love you. Thank you. Thank you, New Orleans. Thank you.